Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight our show might as well be titled, Two People, Three Nobel Prizes. We're going to talk about two people from Great Britain who between them won three Nobel Prizes. First is Doris Lessing, who died recently at the age of 94, and she won the 2007 Nobel Prize for Literature when she was 88 years old. She wrote novels, plays, poetry, all sorts of literature sort of a crusty woman, cantankerous during interviews. Here's the PBS report on Doris Lessing. The author Doris Lessing has died. Lessing won the 2007 Nobel Prize in Literature for a life's work which included more than 50 books of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and memoir. Her book, The Golden Notebook, has been called the first feminist novel, although not by the writer herself. Lessing died early this morning. She was 94 years old. Vicki Barker reports. In the course of a long and eventful life, Doris Lessing was a mother, a self-described house mother for a procession of starving artists, writers, and political refugees, a refugee herself from bourgeois respectability in 1940s white Rhodesia, a campaigner against racism, a lover, an ardent communist, come push, move, and a serial rescuer of cats. She had a hard time in her previous home. But during an interview in Lessing's North London home one dark, cold day, just shy of her 89th birthday, the writer briskly rejected the label most frequently attached to her, feminist icon, particularly when applied to her 1962 novel, The Golden Notebook. It's just stupid. I've said it so often. I mean, there's nothing feminist about The Golden Notebook. The second line is, as far as I can see, everything is cracking up. That is what the Golden Notebook is about. The novel follows Anna Wolfe, a single mother and writer on the verge of a nervous breakdown in post-war London. Wolfe keeps different colored notebooks to chronicle her political, social, sexual, and emotional selves. Only in the Golden Notebook of the novel's title would all these selves finally be integrated. Anna meets her friend Molly in the summer of 1957 after a separation. The author read excerpts from the book for a commercial recording in 1984. The point is, said Anna, as her friend came back from the telephone on the landing, the point is that, as far as I can see, everything's cracking up. The Golden Notebook has been called one of the great and most complex novels of the 20th century, and Lessing, one of the century's most clear-eyed observers. Indeed, even in the science fiction, which she considered her finest work, Lessing's characters live firmly within and are utterly the products of history. Well, my life certainly has been firstly dominated by war, worked to the star. I got married and I had children because of the Second World War, as all of us did exclaiming, oh no, we are never going to bring a child into this wicked world. But we had children by the dozen and got married. Lessing was raised by British parents in what was then called Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. She left school at 13, left home at 15, married for the first time at 19. By the age of 30, Lessing had married again, become disenchanted with her second husband and his communist beliefs, and moved to London with their son. While the novels tend to attack sweeping historical and social themes, Lessing could also work in miniature. In 1999, she read from an essay called A Week in Heidelberg. In it, she trains her powers of observation on a blackbird. She had wooed it to her hotel windowsill with a piece of apple. He knew I was there, or something was making him nervous, and he kept jabbing his beak hard into the apple flesh, then stopping to look at the white screen close to him. And then there was another series of quick downward jabs. To shrink yourself down in imagination and see that gleaming weapon just above you, what a horror, the worm's eye view. For all of the honors showered upon Doris Lessing, the literary establishment seemed ambivalent about her. She was never a great stylist. Author and critic Blake Morrison. What she was was a great observer, a great joiner in, really, engaging with the intellectual movements, the swirls and currents of the day. It is an assessment with which Lessing would likely have agreed. I have done quite a good job of documenting a lot of our times, I think. Some of my books are very good records. You know, looking at it objectively, I've written one or two good books. Lessing once refused to allow the Queen to declare her a dame of the British Empire because, in the author's words, there is no British Empire. She called winning the Nobel Prize a disaster for her writing. But her friends say the money which came with the prize helped ease her final years spent, by her own account, giving interviews and caring for her invalid son.
That was Doris Lessing. Our second Nobel Prize winner tonight is Dr. Frederick Sanger, who died at the age of 95, and he won two Nobel Prizes, one of only four people to do that, along with Linus Pauling, Marie Curie, and John Bardeen. Dr. Sanger won both of his Nobel Prizes in chemistry, the first in 1958 for his figuring out of the structure of insulin through its amino acid sequences. His technique allowed us to figure out other protein structures in the body. He won a second Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1980 for doing sequencing again, but this time it was not with proteins, it was with nucleic acids when he figured out the DNA structure of a virus. Here is Matthew Bannister of the BBC4 last word on Frederick Sanger. Frederick Sanger was the only Briton to win the Nobel Prize twice and one of only four people in the world to achieve this feat. The biochemist, who was based at Cambridge University's Laboratory of Molecular Biology, carried out work on DNA sequencing, which led to the Human Genome Project, the successful mapping of the chemical structure of every gene in the human body. Professor Sir John Walker, himself a Nobel Prize winner, worked alongside Frederick Sanger. He was an inspiration. He taught me really how to lead a group of scientists, and that is from the front by example. He, he worked extremely hard uh, in, the, in the laboratory until the day that he retired, and, and uh, it, it inspired the rest of us. And in 1958, he won his first Nobel Prize for work on the protein insulin. Dr. Emily Grossman is an expert in molecular biology. Proteins were thought of as just this sort of amorphous lump or blob, and no one really knew anything about their chemical structure, or indeed if they had a chemical structure. But what he did is he found a method of, of determining the exact amino acid sequence of proteins. So proteins are made up of amino acids. And he took the protein insulin and he chopped it up into pieces. And he used those pieces to determine how the amino acids fitted together in which order. And what he found, which was really remarkable at this time, was that there was indeed a precise order. So insulin had an exact determined chemical structure. And by extension, he was able to conclude that all proteins did indeed have a distinct linear um, sequence, which was unique to them. And what was, what was the implication of that? Well, the implication was that a little bit later on, Francis Crick came along with his sequence hypothesis. So then came the second Nobel Prize. What was that for? He then started working on not the sequence of proteins, but the sequence of DNA itself and how to determine the precise A's, T's, G's and C's that make up a particular piece of DNA. And he came up with this remarkable technique for doing exactly that. And he was able to use this technique to determine the precise order of bases in a stretch of DNA hundreds and then building up thousands of pieces long. And that technique called DNA sequencing, which is now called the Sanger method after him, was the method that was used in the sequencing of the Human Genome Project. When in 2003, we got a complete readout of the entire human genome. This is hugely significant, yeah. isn't it? It's a revolutionary piece of work. Absolutely. Because by knowing the human genome, which took an awful long time, we now have a reference library to look at anyone's genome. So it's opening up this enormous area of research into diseases, heart disease, cancer. It's been expanding massively over the last 10 years since the Human Genome Project um, was finished, but particularly faster and faster now for personalised treatments for those particularly nasty diseases. Now, it's a page in the textbook, The Sanger Method, finding out the sequence of genes. It's something that everybody just knows now. It's something that's really routinely taught, like algebra. Here's a Nobel.org interview with Dr. Frederick Sanger. But you switched your okay. fields after the first prize. Was well, it, like it wasn't such a serious switch. Uh, my first work was on proteins, you know, the things we're actually made of. The problem was to what we call sequencing, measure, measure the structure of the proteins. And I worked on proteins. Uh, after that, I, I attacked a much more difficult problem, which was the nucleic acids, and particularly DNA. I eventually came up with a method for uh, sequencing DNA and learning about its structure. And that, that's what I got the second prize for. So you were working really on fundamental questions <coughs> about life and where life comes from? That's, that's correct, yes. Uh, rather fundamental questions which uh, were quite mysterious when I started. When I started, there were no sequences known at all, either in proteins or nucleic acid. And during the, you know, I started about 1940, quite a long time ago. I started working on the proteins and uh, I, I obtained a sequence of first protein, insulin, that was ever done. Mm. 
that was sequencing. And then after uh, 1958, when I got the first prize, I decided to attack the nucleic acids, which was a real challenge. We did get a method for doing the sequencing. It was about 1980 I got that prize. And uh, now, of course, that same method is being used to uh, do the human genome. Well, it's very exciting. It's very complicated. There's uh, 3,000 million letters, as it were, in the DNA, and you've got to read all that. You know, we don't know exactly what the applications would be. There's a lot of talk, of course, in uh, newspapers and a wild talk about, uh, you know, they're going to cure all sorts of diseases and things. You don't want to believe that yet, but if you know how it works, then uh, it will be of use to uh, medicine. Do you understand the concerns or fears that people feel when reading about modern biology? Not really, no. <laughs> I mean, there are certain things, of course, you've got to think about. As regards the human genome, the only thing that I've heard about is that uh, some people may have to pay more for their insurance policies. And I don't think that's a very serious thing. I mean, that's a question for the uh, society to decide. Surely, it's much more significant that uh, one should consider what might happen, what good things might happen, that people might be more healthy and more happy. That's what science is about, you see. Try and improve conditions for humanity. But against that, you can worry a bit of, about what your insurance you're going to have to pay. What do you think about the commercial pressures? I think essential thing that happens. I mean, that is a question for society to decide, isn't it? I mean, that's the way uh, capitalism works, isn't it? That uh, people want to make money. If they're working on some good, good useful work, then that should be uh, very agreeable. But it would be nice to know everything that's going on. I mean, there's a lot of work on uh, using the human genome, uh, which is kept secret until, uh, you know, until it's used. So it's not really the ethos of science? Well, not a fundamental science. It is understandable, I think, that people want to make money. We live in a capitalist world, don't we? And uh, we have to face up to it, and it seems to work fairly well. Before your prize and about this time, that you were, you were quite reluctant to take in patents on discoveries. Well, uh, I never had an opportunity, really. I worked for the Medical Research Council. We were not allowed to take patents. And anyhow, I wouldn't have wanted to, I don't think, because uh, I, I wouldn't want to keep my work secret. I was paid by the Medical Research Council, and I, was, I had uh, paid for life, really, by the Medical Research Council. And uh, that was my reward for the work I did. I don't think it would be fair to expect... Uh, you know, to keep my work secret. And it was up to um, the English taxpayer who supported me and gave me this opportunity. And I think that was fair enough. People say that Einstein had a strong religious belief, and you're a Quaker. What is the place of religion within your scientific philosophy? Well, that's rather difficult to, to say. I think uh, I, I was brought up as a Quaker. My father was a a Quaker. I think I, I was never actually a sort of Quaker. I was never a member of the Society of Friends. When, when I got to university and started studying science, I gradually lost interest really in religion and Quakerism. But it has influenced, I think, my philosophy in two ways, really. I mean, the Quakers are pacifists. They will not take human life. And I uh, still go along with that, and I believe that. And the Quakers are also very keen on truth, and they believe in uh, fundamental truth is one of the virtues. And I was brought, brought up with that uh, philosophy that I must not tell lies when I thought about it. And uh, I think this is true, very important for a scientist, because a scientist is really studying truth. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Taps. Dr. Frederick Sanger showed us the shape of things to come, and that's what we're going to close with tonight. The song by Max Frost and the Troopers, written by Barry Weil for the movie Wild in the Streets.